This video is about the basics of diabetes. Maintaining a stable level of blood glucose to meet your body's energy demands is one of the most important parts of your metabolism. This is a graph of blood sugar after eating. It shows what a big difference there is between a normal person and someone with diabetes. In this video, we will discuss what this is all about. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. This is the second of a set of videos leading up to explaining diabetes and its effect on the eye. In the first video, we talked about how your body handles glucose and how insulin works. In this video, we will use that information to understand the basics of diabetes. Remember, this information is for your general understanding of diabetes, but in no way replaces consultation with your doctor. What is diabetes? The traditional answer is it means your body does not have good control over the level of glucose, a kind of sugar in your bloodstream. A more complete answer is that diabetes is more about insulin than about glucose. Decreased production of insulin, or decreased effect of insulin, called insulin resistance, results in a number of metabolic problems, elevated blood sugar among them, that we are going to talk about. To review how your body handles glucose, this slide shows how blood sugar behaves in a normal person after eating. We'll call the start of the graph as fasting, like in the morning before breakfast or between meals. A normal fasting blood sugar is around 90. After a meal, the blood sugar peaks at about an hour, and by two hours is back down near normal. Now look at blood sugar in a person with diabetes, the orange line. It shows no overlap with normal behavior. The fasting sugar starts higher, say 125 or over. After a meal, blood sugar rises to a much higher level and stays there still near its maximum at two hours. So in diabetes, there's too much glucose in the bloodstream and not enough in the cells. Cells must find other sources of energy. Protein and fat metabolism are affected. Damage may occur directly from the elevated glucose, chemical byproducts of glucose, excess oxidation, increased systemic in inflammation, and other processes. Where does the damage happen in diabetes? For a long time, people concentrated on damage to the fine capillary blood vessels, which deliver oxygen and nutrients to the tissues in your body. These are the microvascular complications with damage to the following. The retina, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness between ages 20 and 70. The kidneys, diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure in the U.S. and peripheral nerves. Diabetes also causes atherosclerosis, thereby damaging and narrowing large blood vessels. That causes an increase in stroke, heart attack, and peripheral vascular disease. How do you get diabetes? Here we're only going to talk about the two most common types, aptly named type 1 and type 2. After you eat and food is digested, there is extra glucose in the blood. The pancreas senses that and produces insulin. As insulin binds to its receptor on the surface of a cell, that activates transport of glucose into the cell. Once inside a cell, glucose is used either for energy or stored for later use. If the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin, then glucose can't get into the cells where it is needed and leaves excess in the blood. Elevated blood sugar from inability to produce enough insulin is called type 1 diabetes. 10% of people with diabetes have this kind. Usually, diagnosis is made before age 20, so this used to be called, called juvenile diabetes. The reason insulin is lacking is because the cells that produce it are destroyed. 85% of the time, destruction occurs because your own immune system is triggered to attack the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas. The cells that produce insulin are lost, and the only way to treat this is by taking supplemental insulin. By the way, the discovery of insulin earned two doctors at the University of Toronto a Nobel Prize in 1923. The mechanism of type 2 diabetes is not as simple. Early on, the pancreas is still able to produce insulin at a normal or even elevated level, but the insulin is not having the effect on the tissues it is supposed to. The term for this is insulin resistance. 90% of people who have diabetes have this type. 
Diagnosis is usually made after age 30, so this used to be called adult onset diabetes. A significant part of this is inherited. The mechanism of insulin resistance is still being worked out, but we will consider a plausible model. Here is a diagram of all the things insulin does within a target cell, like liver or muscle. It may look complicated, but this is meant to show how many things insulin affects. It's been known for a long time that overweight is a clear predisposing factor for insulin resistance, particularly the presence of abdominal fat. This theory proposes that excess fatty acids in the blood get into the cells and interfere with the signaling machinery inside the cell. There is still insulin in the receptors working, but blockage of the signals within the cell slows down glucose transport and all other functions dependent on insulin. Early in type 2 diabetes, the insulin-producing cells may work harder to produce more insulin than normal. Eventually, those cells may become burned out and the production of insulin drops, requiring use of supplemental insulin. We cannot leave this subject without mentioning metabolic syndrome. In the U.S., it affects 25% of people in middle age and 35% of the older population. It starts with weight gain, particularly in the abdominal area. It is associated with elevated blood lipids, high blood pressure, and insulin resistance. This group of findings is recognized as a strong predisposition to developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. To understand the tests used to diagnose diabetes, recall this graph of blood sugar after eating. The most reliable time to distinguish normal from diabetes is either fasting or two hours after eating. Here are the testing standards considered as making the diagnosis. A fasting plasma glucose over 125, a random blood sugar over 200 along with the classic symptoms, drinking lots of fluid, frequent urination, and weight loss. A glucose tolerance test is less commonly used. This year, a new test has been added by the American Diabetes Association, the A1C test, which we will talk about in a moment. If fasting blood sugar is between 100 and 125, that is considered borderline or pre-diabetic. The basic goal of treatment of diabetes is to reduce complications. Since the subject of this video is not specifically diabetes treatment, we will discuss this in general terms. First, there are basic lifestyle changes that most people with diabetes will benefit from. Since overweight is a big part of the cause of type 2 diabetes, weight loss goes a long way to help make control easier. Likewise, regular exercise is very helpful and stop smoking. Things your doctor will work on depend on your particular situation. Controlling blood sugar, blood pressure, abnormal blood lipids, and abnormal clotting. In terms of blood sugar, the idea is to get it as near as normal as possible without making a significant risk of hypoglycemia. The usual target is an A1C of 7 or less. Base this on your doctor's advice. In monitoring your own glucose, finger stick and glucose meter are the usual tools done on a daily basis. A1C provides a measure for a two or three month period of time. It turns out the A1C value has a very good correlation with complication rates, making it the most useful tool for long-term follow-up. On the left is a red blood cell responsible for picking up oxygen from the lungs and carrying it to the tissues. Contained within red cells is hemoglobin consisting of four protein chains called globins, each with a central heme group. That's where the oxygen is attached. As a red blood cell is circulating in the bloodstream, it is bathed in many other substances, including glucose. Glucose molecules are a bit sticky and over time attach themselves to the hemoglobin. The higher the blood glucose, the more glucose molecules stick on. Hemoglobin A1C is the percent of hemoglobin that have glucose molecules attached. To review, in diabetes, elevated blood sugar and other pathologic processes cause damage to both small and large blood vessels throughout the body. In the next video, we will look at the relation between blood sugar control and specific complications. The message is that the effort you spend in controlling blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids makes a big difference in your long-term health.